you very much, Frank. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, and I've got that, so the only thing I need is something to click. Does somebody have a clicker? It's right here, they say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, it didn't come with instructions. Um, uh, so, I'm, I'm having deja vu right now. I, I could have sworn I was in a place like this just minutes ago. Uh, uh, every year, Every year uh, for the last, and this is the 14th year, for 14 years, I, I've had the true privilege, and I will say honor, uh, to uh, address uh, this audience, or virtually this audience, uh, to do a, an op-ed piece, to tell you what a single individual in the field thinks. Uh, I, I make uh, no claims that this is purely objective or in every respect actually factual, but on the other hand, I'm not selling an agenda. I admit, I tend to like, like wires and hardware a little bit more than software, uh, but on the other hand, you know, software, if nothing else, justifies building and paying for these machines. Um, uh, I, I started this uh, thanks to uh, the late Hans Maurer, uh, of which I'll always be grateful, uh, at the Heidelberg uh, version of the conference, and uh, have had the pleasure to do this uh, ever, ever since. Now, I'm going to twist this pedestal because I can't quite see. There we go. All right. Every year I try to identify a, a single theme, and, and for some years it gets pretty hard because, frankly, there wasn't anything interesting that happened. Uh, that's certainly not true this year. In fact, the challenge faced this year, and I would be curious uh, to learn what uh, each of you uh, think about this, uh, I chose sort of the low-hanging fruit, and that is something that has really picked up across the community and across the world, and that is planning for the, the achievement, whatever it means, of exascale computing within the next few years. There are other possibilities, and I think many of you might have selected uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning as a true driving uh, characteristic in the new computing era, and I'll, I'll say something about that as well. But, but unlike previous years, I would say now, again, uh, going from east to west, in my perspective, from China and Japan, and from U.S. and Europe, uh, we have uh, a, a fairly clear picture, uh, maybe a little disappointingly so, of what exascale is going to be. Here I, I chose what I think represent the elements of the overall trends that we're facing. And one of those is the strong clarification and redirection of where the HPC community is going, both in one sense expanding on the importance uh, through the application to data sciences, again machine learning, and even even uh, into the uh, more important uh, <laughs> bias alert uh, to uh, other aspects of artificial intelligence, as well as very large complex uh, uh, phenomenology and uh, uh, detailed. Uh, uh, numeric uh, processing. Uh, as I just said, uh, I selected uh, uh, the concrete plans for exaflops, and I will I will relate some of those to you as I understand them at this time. Uh, well, so 100 petaflops is here. Oh no, wait, it was here last year. Um, uh, still, and again, my congratulations, uh, heartfelt. Uh, to our colleagues in uh, China with the uh, uh, Taihu light machine. And what is an original architecture, not a copy of anybody else's, an entirely uh, homegrown, uh, still a remarkable accomplishment, more so because of the applications that they have running on it. A very uh, significant advance and continues to be a positive trend within our field. I'm just watching all these students run away. It gets funnier. <laughs> See, they're laughing. <laughs> All right, they're going for the video games, I know. Uh, it's in the area of energy efficiency. And this is absolutely critical because if we are going to get to and beyond exaflops computing, uh, we have to bring the energy efficiency up and by substantial degrees. And I will uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, graph processing, in my view, is the really big hurdle in front of us, and it's now being taken seriously. It is big as a complete paradigm shift. First 65 years dedicated to matrix computations with hardware support.
for indexing and, and vector processing through pipelining. And now we're facing a time when the data structures are immersed in metadata, but the hardware doesn't know how to use that. And so we find many different companies in multiple um, uh, nations and with uh, many different uh, academic and industrial institutions both applying graph processing and learning how to expedite, accelerate uh, that. And I think this is very important, and I hope to say more about this next year. Uh, I've already spoken of the importance of machine learning, uh, and I will say a few words uh, about this. I believe it's a field in flux. And forgive me if I say so, but I also think it's a field in hype. And uh, I've, I've lived through too many of these moments of pipe. This doesn't mean it lacks credibility or importance or impact. But as we'll see, uh, it's been overstated in terms of its do uh, dominance in the area of artificial intelligence. I, I, I'd like to cite uh, the transition for um, Hewlett Packard uh, Enterprise. What's the E stand for? For Hewlett Packard E. Uh, and how they have now merged, and this is a significant change. HP has always been successful in the field of HPC, always running number one or number two in the number of deployed systems. Really remarkable and beautifully engineered stuff. And now, finally, they're showing, in my view, the courage to move up to the front row, where they are looking at and competing uh, and to make contributions in the area of exascale, not waiting for everybody else to do it and come up uh, about an order of magnitude beyond. So, so I think this is a very important uh, to see, and it's wonderful to have another major uh, engineering uh, operation that's um, uh, competing and pushing the true edge of the envelope. You know, I, I have been here in front of, well, the virtual you, and, and uh, I thought I'd never talk about quantum computing. I mean, I, I can remember standing here and, and, and saying, you know, trying to uh, explain quantum computing is like teaching computer science at Hogwarts. <laughs> but you know, it's easier these days to work some, with something you don't have to understand at all. I mean, look, look at neural nets. <laughs> and so I'll close uh, with uh, what I think is a, uh, certainly the most important scientific breakthrough over the last year, which has been only possible uh, in part because of being enabled by, by supercomputing over the last year. Uh, but this important breakthrough actually didn't happen. And so I'll finish with that. All right. Okay. Uh, I picked the Tsubami 3 architecture to just briefly talk about. I wish I could give it more time, but uh, uh, the, the team at Tokyo Institute of Technology, and led by Satoshi Matsuoko, uh, has deliberately and consistently pushed the practical uh, edge of the envelope and architecture to bring up the energy efficiency and uh, the system, Tsubami 3, which, no surprise, follows Tsubami 2 and it, Tsubami 1. Um, it works that way, nice order progression. Uh, this machine, uh, which has a very complicated uh, interconnects and a balance of uh, processors and coprocessors and accelerators and advanced cooling systems, which I cannot go into in detail, uh, was announced as the number one uh, machine uh, for the Green 500, showing a uh, RMAX to power ratio of uh, over 14, 14.11. Uh, and this is a really impressive number. I remember when it was really hard to get uh, one, um, uh, uh, one uh, gigaflops per watt uh, for systems. And this is more than an order of magnitude. In fact, it's less than a factor four away from what we need, or so we claim, uh, to achieve uh, uh, pet, uh, exaflops computer. That, that, that's, that's really remarkable. We are in arm's reach with all the challenges, all the problems we have at so many levels, hardware and software, programming and algorithms, uh, and, and enabling technology. This is breaking. And uh, from uh, various talks given by Eric Strohmeyer, 
uh, we can see that breakpoint and this successive progression uh, to which the uh, uh, people at uh, Tokyo Tech have been a major contributor and certainly, again, number one. But if you look at this chart, you can't help but notice, unless your eyes are closed, uh, that there seems to be a continuous story about how to achieve this. Almost every one of these platforms are taking advantage of, yes, the uh, 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 NVIDIA uh, P100, uh, I'm sorry, the, te uh, the, the NVIDIA Tesla uh, P100 system, which is demonstrating when you have hardware that is carefully aligned in, in the proper kind of cluster that follows the workflow or the data paths, so that you don't have to use intermediate buffers, which are energy consuming as well as time consuming, uh, then you can get, for those uh, idioms, those uh, algorithm elements, you can get superior performance, you can also get superior energy efficiency. And so there's an underlying story here. Congratulations to Tokyo Tech, but congratulations to NVIDIA as well. Yeah, go ahead, let's, let's, let's give them a call. come on. Okay, so you know how to do that. So I'm going to get to the end of my talk at some point, and I'd like you to try that again, but with a little bit more energy and enthusiasm. If you can just remember that. And if not, I'll tell you. All right, so I, I think if I look at this year and I look at the uncertainties and the complexities, what I have seen this year is the commitment internationally towards exascale computing. Not for sake of pride and stature and, and making a claim on, on some particular squiggly chart that, that uh, our, our friends have done. By the way, I like the squiggly chart. Don't misunderstand me. But because we understand in the new society that we live in, which is science, which is economic, which is, which is social, and, and frankly, yes, also, which is defense and security, that, that the highest end of computing adds positively in all of those, all of those ways. And um, these uh, five factors all are shared by every institution, every government agency around the world who are looking to make a useful tool and an accessible tool and to train us, but more importantly train the next generation to be able to apply those tools uh, to the future. Let me let me talk about the, the U.S. Okay, let me talk about the U.S. Um, uh, I was part of a committee that was then part of a committee, and these are the results. They identified ten technical challenges. I don't want to read them all, but if you do a quick scan down there, you say yes. This is not in any case uh, ordered uh, by some priority because, in truth, they're so inter interrelated, so cross coupling that uh, no one of these are good without, without the others. I, I will highlight the importance of scientific productivity. I don't know how to measure that. I've tried. I've written equations. I've published equations. But I don't know what the units for scientific productivity is. And yet, that is the end factor. When we say scientific, we mean that in the, in the broadest sense. Uh, also, you see at the top of this list, no problems, and everyone understands that energy efficiency uh, is the case. Uh, I know that the person who first put out the, uh, the, the standard, uh, the requirement, the threshold of 20 megawatts per, for, uh, for an exoplast, I won't mention his, his name, uh, and uh, many, some in his room, especially from industry, said, no, that's no good, and they said it was, you know, maybe 20 to 40 megawatts. The truth is 20 megawatts is too high. It's not too low. We don't want to build one-offs. We want everyone with a machine room to have an exascale machine so that they can all be doing the breakthrough science, uh, uh, engineering, uh, social requirements, and, and yes, defense as well. Uh, I should be giving credit where credit is due. Uh, the slides I'm currently showing you are from the uh, ECP, or Exascale Computing Project, which are available online, uh, uh, and summarize the uh, intentions, the philosophy, and the goals of the U.S. Exascale Computing Project. There's more than one person in the room who's directly involved in, in leading that. And here is a simple chart that shows the importance, simultaneously, 
We use a phrase co-design of combining uh, uh, advanced development in applications, in software technology, and in hardware technology together uh, to create ultimately the exascale systems. Now think about this. For how long has it been that mostly we've had the hardware thrown over the fence at the, at the programming people and they sort of had to figure out how to make it work? So the ECP uh, initiative is important because it tries to move the bar on all of these together forward. And this is the right, more advanced uh, philosophy. I love this chart because it shows how we increase the delivered performance, underlying delivered, uh, through advances in hardware and um, software technology. And what you're seeing here is that initially, uh, back in the uh, days of, uh, <coughs> I beg your pardon, gigaflops up to teraflops, uh, uh, teraflops um, uh, 1997, uh, for some of you that's history, uh, the uh, uh, teraflops, this was mostly uh, from the actual technology advances, Moore's Law, but Moore's Law also did require, with increased density, increased exploitation of parallelism. And, you know, roughly speaking, and there's a lot of uh, there are error bars on these, but it was about half and half. And that took us for a long ride up the exponential slope. But as we got past uh, teraflops and started to get about halfway to the petaflops, around 32 teraflops uh, uh, logarithmically, <clears throat> We found that we were getting less performance from the transistor, and by uh, two, and yeah, it matches up. Around 2005 or so, we had to move to the new usage of multi-core, which means added amounts of parallelism. And past uh, to that point, uh, we are now dedicated expressly to more than two orders of magnitude of parallelism. We expect with with less than a factor of two from the actual hardware delivered. We are truly at the end of an exponential growth of Moore's Law. And we face uh, new challenges in being able to increase the deliberate performance on ever more complicated applications. And yet for some of us, this is perhaps one of the most exciting times for system development and architecture, perhaps even programming models since the 1980s. Again, history for many of you. Um, yeah, so there, there's a wide range of uh, key domains of application that uh, the Exascale project is focusing on in order to advance. So their true measurement of success is the success and the achievement at the science level, at the end result level, not, not necessarily the particular values uh, there. I won't, uh, I won't read all through these, though... <clears throat> Um, you know, you might want to really look at this slide, you may never see it again, because, well, it does mention uh, doing thing with uh, tur wind turbines and solar, and it does mention climate change simulation. So, you know, you saw it once, you may not see it again. Right. I'm not a happy camper. I, I didn't survive to be 67 years old to see this kind of circus going on. <laughs> I, I trust we're not videoing this. You know, I think that this is a particularly insightful software stack. In particular, it's noted that there, has to, there is a new relationship between the node operating system and the system operating system. And, and appreciating and understanding that interrelationship to achieve in combination, in synergy, uh, the improved... <laughs> I'm not sensitive. Uh, this this uh, also points out the importance of math libraries and frameworks. And these are so important because uh, user productivity, as well as performance, uh, I'm sorry, uh, performance portability across a diversity of machine types, of machine generations, and machine scales, 
is to a major degree uh, going to depend on, uh, uh, on the achievement of math libraries that themselves are portable, making it much easier for the users. This is the path to success. People say, people, right? People say that they're willing to change once. And they don't mean and then they're going to die. They mean that we are okay, we're a community, we're not scared of the future. But, but we're not going to waste our time either. This kind of software stack, and there, again, the interrelationship of the elements, demonstrates a path to achieving that goal. Uh, one example of the way the U.S. is going to exascale is through uh, uh, stages of uh, interim machines in the, uh, in the regime of uh, hundreds of petroflops, and, and the coral systems uh, will have three machines. Two of these are um, uh, Summit and, oh, I hope I get this right, Sierra at, uh, at uh, the first at Oak Ridge National Lab and the second at Livermore National Lab. This machine is uh, the Aurora machine to be deployed at, um, <coughs> uh, to be deployed at Argonne National Lab. Now, these are not all the same machine, yet the first two are based on the IBM Power 9 uh, processor, which is absolutely a heavy hitter. And uh, while I'm not sure that's the way I would think about going about it, I mean, you know, the power series have been an elegant architecture. Uh, and uh, one can, and then, and then add to that NVIDIA acceleration. And so so uh, Oak Ridge, which will probably be the first point of deployment sometime towards the end of uh, 2018 and then on. Aurora uh, is a counter design, and that's built on fine grained processors based on uh, the Intel, I guess it's Knights Hill. I uh, hope I get that right. Someone will scream out if I don't. Uh, Knights Hill. And um, uh, all, both of these machines are somewhere in the 200 petaflops range of performance, somewhere between peak and delivered. I'm not sure uh, which. Um, but these will give us an enormous amount of information as the U.S. considers what the, uh, the, the machines shortly thereafter will be in the, and now I get really confused about the dates somewhere in the 2022 to 2024 regime at different stages of uh, deployment. The Europeans have a very uh, firm plan in how to advance towards exit scale. Uh, they are setting up centers of excellence in a number of domains of science and engineering and other places, uh, very much invested in the future of system software frameworks and environments uh, to make it readily available to the uh, to computational scientists and and domain and, and domain uh, scientists, recognizing the need to advance concurrently in the areas of uh, data intensive uh, programming tools, algorithms. Uh, you probably figured figured out I'm reading them from the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, mathematics, memory and storage, and then we get into the area of hardware. Uh, and as you see on this particular different chart which I hope the text is small enough so you can't read it, uh, has in the upper left-hand corner HPC system architectures. Now, when you look at the overall history of the European Union, you see tremendous advances in clouds, in data processing, in programming environments, uh, in, and especially in applications. A billion euros committed to uh, graphene, a billion euros converted, uh, com uh, com committed to uh, brain modeling, uh, and uh, yet you haven't really seen that kind of energy or enthusiasm committed uh, to the sometimes thankless task of trying to wire uh, processors together. I've been there, I did that. Um, uh, but. You know, the wonderful thing about our community is, and, and, and in the U.S., <laughs> I mean, we get, we don't, we de don't deal with facts anymore. It's a really liberating uh, opportunity. I mean, uh, I'm waiting for, you know, the theses, the first ones on alternative facts, and uh, putting in the power. But there are rumors that say, oh no, Europe, Europe has got it in hand, there are going to be two different classes of machines developed for exascale. For reasons I do not understand, France seems to have its name tagged on to these machines. Uh, all I can say is, you know, stay tuned to next year. I hope I know more about it. Now, my apologies to my colleagues in China. 
You won't talk. Okay, I want to know what you're doing. Um, I get it, you're number one. Okay, and you've been number one. And when you weren't number one, you became number one. Okay, so we, we, we appreciate the accomplishment, but we'd like to know what you're doing. We may have to be buying the machines. Give us a hint. All right, um, uh, the, uh, their, uh, China has announced that it will deliver, deploy uh, its first exascale machine, which I think one could simply say is the first exascale machine in the year 2020. And you know, that's not just bragging. You can take these guys seriously, excuse me, these guys and these women seriously, because they're not fooling around. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the importance of the Sunway machine to me is that they designed it from the sand up, and they are continuing to expand their own architecture designs and fabrication capabilities. For example, the Matrix 2000 GPDSP2 is a, uh, uh, a specialized processor, 2.4 petaflops, double precision. Don't fool around with that 32-bit stuff. Uh, and um, there are a number of key players. Infor, NUDT, and Sunway are just among the few. I will even say, more importantly, what I have been finding out is the rapid increase in the number of applications programmers that are using these systems and the number of domains which are increasing in which they are using these systems. Uh, very, very uh, impressive. Uh, Japan, you got to hand it to them. When they built a machine, they built a great machine. I can remember being in the Aegean on an island with Jack Dungara, a bunch of other people, and they came out with the Earth Simulator. I mean, that, that just to date it, that's 40 teraflops, by the way. These machines are well built. Uh, they can take a bomb hit. And their, their networking balance, both in latency and bandwidth, is the best we get in, these, uh, in, in supercomputing when they deliver. And this was also true with the delivery of the uh, K machine uh, uh, five or six years ago, which I had the pleasure of seeing. I even have a picture of myself. Why didn't I put that up? I love pictures of myself. I sell postcards. Um, but, and uh, you know the phrase, deja vu all over again, there is a rapidly increasing and substantive commitment to uh, the uh, uh, achievement of implementing AI. AI is that lovely phrase, almost everybody knows how to spell it, and uh, it um, can be used to mean a lot of different things. If you were, again, I reach back in the distant past of the 1980s, and we had the fifth generation computer project in which uh, the Japanese were really investing heavily, and in some ways, in very clever ways, uh, to explore or expand on the, the uh, uh, ability to bring smart computing to bear to real, uh, to real problems. And, and, you know, fortunately for the U.S., they did that because only then did the U.S. say, oh, we're in trouble, so then they started to spend money. When the Japanese spend money, we do. When they don't, we don't. So, um, unless, of course, you're building rockets, and that used to be with the Russians, but now we just hired the South African and he's taking care of it for us. Um, although he's, 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 Elon Musk is just being a little cheap. He keeps using his old rockets. We want new, smiley ones, fancy things. So. All right, so, uh, but, but it's not used. I'm sorry, I said used. Uh, marketing says these are flight proven. <laughs> I'm an astronaut, I'm not sure I want to be on a flight proven <laughs> rocket. Uh, there has been a long and stable and growing project in the applications of artificial intelligence and feeding the lessons learned back into both the software systems, including programming models, and to help drive the structures of future architectures uh, that are happening. Okay, I know this is pretty cheesy. What I'm showing you is a slide of a picture of a slide <laughs> of a picture. And you'd think, uh, what, was this done at the last minute? You couldn't actually get it. Well, yeah, it was done at the last minute. I couldn't get it. But, but it comes out okay. This shows you the post-K machine, which is the next system that the Japanese will be deploying, and it too will serve as the prototype of uh, their exascale system. Actually, if you look at the statistics of the ex expected ex uh, specification, you know, they're going to be within a, uh, a hair's width away, at least in peak, 
to achieving uh, exascale itself, but they're not going to do that. They, their, uh, their, their exascale machine, uh, currently the terminology for it is, well, this is, they had K and they had post K, so which, which frankly sounds like a serial to me. Um, but, uh, uh, so the next machine will be post post K. Yeah, it worries me. <laughs> you, you can see where this is going. All right. Well, this is always the unpleasant part of, of uh, the presentation, but it is ever so important that, that we take a moment to acknowledge the passing of some people who have truly contributed to where we are, even if we've never, we've never heard of them. Um, and you probably haven't heard of our, Herb Richmond, but I seem to be locked, locked in the 1980s. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a very different world, a very exciting world. And it was the invention of the mini-computer that told us that computing was approaching being for everybody, as opposed to the six machines that Thomas Watson thought the world would need. The mini-computer uh, was hotly contested, and the two major companies were Digital Equipment Corporation and the company that Herbert Richmond started uh, in the uh, 1960s, uh, uh, Data General. <coughs> You may not have even heard of Data General, but at that time, Data General was cool. I mean, a very young Steve Wallach, I know, tried to think about that, a very young Steve Wallach uh, worked for Data General. It was so neat that uh, 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 Tracy Kidder, sorry, I was having a, um, a moment there, Tracy Kidder wrote the book, The Soul of a New Machine, which took place at, uh, at uh, Data General, and, and Herb was the backbone. Well, the CEO, he was a VP, but he was the backbone, he was the soul, he was the spirit of Data General. They had many successes and they made many failures, but it was at a time when people could take risks, and uh, I remember running on the first Eclipse that I had my hands on. I had already used uh, Digital Equipment Corporation companies. Um, Herb was 82, uh, many, many friends, uh, but not known for this generation. But at least I'm pleased that I can take a moment to acknowledge uh, his many, many contributions. You may have heard of uh, uh, Chuck Thatcher. You've certainly heard of Chuck's contributions. Chuck was at uh, Xerox Park. He contributed to uh, key networking, uh, to distributed computing, he was, he was a, a, a driver of the first experimental tablets. Uh, he built the first hardware for Ethernet, the three megabits per second. He did it. Yeah, Metcalf and Boggs, they, they did the protocols and so forth, but he did the implementation. And the implementers, by the way, are in control because they determine success and failure. And he was uh, a key player in the development of the Alto. And the Alto was really the pointer up to the future. Uh, the ACM just posthumously uh, awarded him the Eckert Mockley Award, the highest award that you can receive in artificial intelligence. Chuck was a good guy. But we're a field that uh, doesn't uh, Pause. So, uh, there are a number of awards that are given uh, in our field, and I'll just touch on these, but I'd like to at least acknowledge uh, their, their accomplishments and, and uh, their recognition. Uh, Bill Camp, many of you know Bill. Uh, Bill ran in, uh, an operation at Sandia that resulted in, in many different things. He built a culture. I've had the pleasure of uh, working within that environment. Uh, and it is one of the, in my opinion, it is one of the best cultures, places, communities that one can do uh, advanced exploration in high performance computing. I'll just read uh, the assertion, for visionary leadership uh, of the Red Storm project and for decades of leadership of uh, high performance computing. Now the Red Storm project became the prototype for the renaissance at Cray. Uh, Inc. Uh, because it became the uh, Cray XT3, which led on to a very successful family 
of high performance computing. Um, my uh, friend and colleague Bipin Kumar, rightfully and frankly I think a little late, uh, received the uh, Fernbach Award uh, for uh, foundational work on understanding scalability uh, and highly scalable algorithms for graph partitioning, sparse linear systems, and data mining. Uh, Vipin, always a friendly and dignified individual. No ego focused on the next problem, which always makes its practical outcome with theoretical insight. Bill Gropp, who I did see around here, I don't see him here, but you're all sort of blurry to me anyway. Bill Gropp received uh, the Ken Kennedy Award for highly influential contributions to the programmability of high-performance parallel and distributed computers, an extraordinary service to the profession, and if I've ever read an acolyte, this is the most understated one I have ever encountered. Bill is an extraordinary individual. Every one of us who has touched a supercomputer in one way or another are benefactors of the many decades of contributions that uh, Bill has made. Bill, uh, a professor at the University of Illinois, formerly at Argonne, and now, and I'm going to get it wrong, uh, he's either acting or internal, or um, interment, oh, I don't know. Anyway, NCSA. Uh, he's, uh, and, and seriously, um, it, it's, uh, you know, any award given to Bill is far too late. Uh, it, it, they're, whoops, sorry. Okay, and if you've ever used the World Wide Web, well, um, you know, Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, yeah, he did that. Uh, so somebody decided to recognize him with what is probably the highest stature award, period, in the field of computing, and that's the, that's the Turing Award. All incredibly justifiably uh, made, and all four of these people uh, have made our world, our profession, a uh, better place. Oh, and now a word from our sponsor. Um, I was asked to, I'm under, I understand that there are students here who are participating in the uh, student STEM uh, event. Now, given what I've been watching over the last few minutes of students, <laughs> I'm a little less psyched about this. Uh, but I do want to praise, in spite of the, um, uh, the unappreciative uh, young people, I do want to praise uh, ISC for starting uh, this uh, activity uh, to attract uh, students into the world of HPC through the experience of ISC, to expose them both to the technical skills that are involved in making people understand that these, these are usable, and at the same time telling them about careers that are available in HPC, and, and I'm going to go attend because I need to find a career in HPC. Um, and let me read this, uh, oh, and introduce him to the related job market now and 2020. There's a big party tonight, and none of you are invited. Um, <laughs> but, but I was invited. Uh, and uh, I, uh, please, a shout out to Natchez, uh, congratulations to her for all of her initiative, drive, and vision in, in making this happen. And, and also, thanks to the many sponsors uh, that funded this very important thing. Our responsibility here is to prepare the next generation. And this is an important action on the part of ISC uh, to uh, help that out. So, um, you know, I really don't know what time it is. I suppose when there's nobody left in the room except myself, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. We're coming to the end. But uh, uh, every year, uh, we, we go off and we do some analysis of, of the field. During, we borrow the material, very good material from Jack and Eric, uh, and uh, Horst, uh, in understanding, doing the data mining, this is what's so good about the uh, HPL, uh, the Limpact benchmark, because as long as we don't misinterpret it, as long as we don't use it for uh, malicious or deceiving purposes, and God help us, as long as we don't actually design machines to it, oh, nobody would do that, <laughs> um, uh, it helps us to appreciate the market, and the design challenges. And what we discovered is we can really consider this not as a top 500 list, but as three, three basically different worlds, all of which we glued together. And so this is a chart of uh, the, at the supercomputing. This. And, and the, for those of you who haven't seen this, the instant message is, whoa, right? 90% of the machines 
are practically within a factor of two to four of each other in performance. They're almost all at the same level. And then there are the high-end machines, which um, are, uh, in fact, those machines that we talk about and we brag about. We talk about the top ten. How about the other, uh-oh, Frank is at that time. <laughs> Let's see, if you turn to left, I'm in trouble. Okay, I'm in trouble. <laughs> almost done. But uh, for this case, we looked at, we're talking about exascale, but what are the units? Well, we all have different units. Why are we not talking about the memory capacity? It's half the price of the machine. Why are we not talking about the memory bandwidth? That is, in fact, the principal performance strangulation to achieving deliberate performance, or wouldn't it be sweeter, reduction to time to solution? And so here you find a very interesting bimodal uh, situation, which uh, we haven't shown. The amount of memory in, that, in the, the uh, top world, in the uh, extreme world, is much, much larger than the memory across um, uh, the rest of the world, including the mainstream, or that uh, long tail I showed you. But when you look at it from a different way, you find that in most cases, I don't know what number seven was, but in most cases you find that it's the smaller machines that have a better, uh, I would call it a healthier ratio of um, uh, the amount of memory you have given the floating point operations that you can perform peak. So, so I, I, did, did that ever work, the, the clock over there? Yeah. Okay, keep going. Should I talk faster? Um, so, uh, and, and these I want to thank uh, uh, Tarek El Ghazawi of uh, one of the universities in the Washington DC area uh, for helping me with this. Uh, very importantly, we're talking about brain-inspired computing. I just came from a conference in Italy uh, entitled uh, Brain-Inspired Computing. And this involves many things. It involves trying to understand what the real brain is, and also trying to be in, uh, motivated and informed by the structure of the brain in making new generations of computers. And so, uh, you know, the question is, so why are, why are we so fascinated with the human brain? And, and I figured it out. I figured it out. It, our, our brains are all narcissists. They, they really like to talk about themselves. Um, and, and our purpose is sad, isn't it? Our purpose is simply to, you know, carry the brains around. Uh, to uh, make it e their lives easier. Uh, there, are, there are major projects, 1 billion euros in the uh, European Union spent, in, spent for the Human Brain Project, uh, the uh, earlier but still running Blue Brain Project at EPFL uh, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, the blue, of course, suggests IBM. And uh, in the US, uh, I haven't checked in the New York Times, today, so this may be old news, but the, the Brain Initiative, um, a very imaginative name, the Brain Initiative, principally run by the National Institute of Health, uh, with overlapping but really different emphases. In the case, and I do not object to this, of the U.S. program, uh, it is to emphasize the medical implications and opportunities of understanding the structure, uh, the dynamics, and the chemistry of the human brain for addressing uh, such problems as Alzheimer's and many other brain-related diseases. But um, uh, in doing the simulation, uh, focusing on uh, the brain themselves, you know, there, I, I oversimplify, but there are two general approaches. One is have as many uh, uh, surrogates for the neurons as you can, and then have as large a possible network you can. And the assumption here is that, that the brain functionality is primarily represented by how the networking, the uh, synergy, the symbiosis of the neurons is. The other approach is model with the highest fidelity what a neuron is, assuming it's that functionality that ultimately determines, uh, yes, in partnership with other neurons, and, and look at that. And both of these approaches are very important and being done uh, today. <clears throat> but then there is the brain-inspired computing. How do I build um, a smarter machine in IBM uh, this year uh, has announced its work on True North, which has the equivalent of a, a million uh, neurons and a quarter of a billion uh, synaptic junctions with uh, uh, five billion transistors uh, on a chip. And uh, it uses, no surprise, 
non von Neumann programming model to make it easy to set that up, and then it being applied uh, to re real world applications. So I now come to a close, almost, um, and I want to tell you about what I think is, in fact, the greatest high performance compute, high performance computing enabled scientific discovery that didn't happen that is going to have enormous impact in us understanding the reality of which we are a product. And that is likely to change the course of theoretical physics uh, uh, that has gone on for the last 10 to 15 years. So yes, March Hadron Collider, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, very cool, Higgs boson, and you got all that. Um, big instruments, Atlas, and what is it, CMC, do I have that right? Uh, all doing things and producing gazillions of bytes of data. And con computers, over 167 different sites have computers that are analyzing this data. I mean, in Titan alone, Titan in the US, in Titan alone we burn uh, hundreds of millions of processor hours per week just on LHC data. This is as much a computing product as it is a giant uh, synchrotron product. And, and here's the chart. And this is where the big, big discovery is. We don't see it. There's supposed to be a bump on that yellow dot dotted line going up into that space, which is vacuous till we used a lot of words. Because we didn't need to do anything else there, because there wasn't anything else. What should have been there was some uh, change in the uh, asymptote, the lower asymptote, plus some bumps. Because there were supposed to be masses identified that reflect supersymmetric particles. And without supersymmetry, a whole space of modeling, theoretically, known as string theory and superstring theory, can't be right. Now, I was warned if there's anybody from Princeton, I know you disagree. Um, and uh, no doubt somebody will be glad to listen to you uh, during a coffee break or so, but not now. Um, what this means is that we didn't discover anything there. And because of this negative result, not this confirming result, this negative result tells us we have to look elsewhere, and that elsewhere is probably loop quantum gravity, which while contentious has one lovely property, and that property is it actually helps uh, uh, coordinate or, or combine both uh, general relativity and, um, and quantum mechanics, because it defines a finite granularity, this is where I'm supposed to say something about Planck, a finite uh, granularity to the gravitational field, which in fact is the definition of space itself, and, uh, and the uh, quantum time. And together, a lot of infinities go away. And so loop quantum gravity is supported by the lack of supersymmetry. Uh, nothing could be more profound, more fundamental, as we in inch our way forward to an understanding of uh, the reality of the cosmos and our place in it than a negative result that fails to confirm an expectation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and your patience.